Okay. Okay. We're, we welcome you to uh, Lesson 5 of our course, Old Testament Books of History. And we thank God that uh, Jackie can be with us in the chat room. She's in Augusta, Georgia. That's about two hour, two hour, two and a half hour drive from here, uh, ministering to her mom and dad. Her mom has had some medical challenges, and so, but we do know what they're having for dinner tonight because we heard her phone call. Okay, so uh, collard greens and baked chicken and potato souffle. Ryan said he's on the road, and that makes him hungry. But Ryan, you keep your eye on the road and drive carefully. By the way, Ryan, is it snowing up in Pennsylvania? Uh, no, it's not there, Dr. Carter. Uh, but I'll tell you, I'm still in Jersey. But I'll tell you what, uh, I'm going to take on I-95 South, and I'm going to head to Augusta, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, okay. I-95. So, Jackie, you save Ryan some of that grub, okay? Save him some grub. <laughs> and the porch light is always on. Okay, keep the lights on. Keep the light on for Ryan, baby. Keep the light on for Ryan. All right. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So good to see so many of you on. Karen, how are you doing tonight, Karen? Hey, Dr. Carter. Doing okay. A little tired. It's been a crazy week starting up at work so <laughs> yeah okay 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 well make sure you all make sure you all get some rest now don't overdo it praise god yeah yeah and, uh, <clears throat> i'm going to commend karen karen is really burning up these courses i tell you and um but you all are doing well hey karen i was talking with jackie carter yesterday i call her jackie carter my precious wife jackie i was talking with jackie mm -hmm. carter yesterday and um Jackie said, man, in, in essence, she said, man, you need to lighten up on these homework assignments. <laughs> Karen, Karen, she said, you need to lighten up on these homework assignments. She said, man, that's a lot of work. And uh, she just completed <laughs> lesson five of, the, of this current um, lesson, the lesson we're going over tonight. And she said, yeah, you only gave us two questions, but it was a lot of work. Well, bless God. I, I praise God for every one of you. Karen, Karen, you're doing a great job, and you're setting the pace for a lot of people. But I thank God for every one of you. Lisa Johnson's on with us, and Jackie Carter, and Ryan, and you all are doing such a great work. Brian Whitaker, and uh, really proud of you all for the work you're doing, and so many others. Uh, Christy Carpenter up in uh, Kuna, Idaho. Christy said it's bitter cold up there, and it's snowing. But she still sent in her lesson today. So pray for Christy and all the folks up in um, Idaho. It's cold up there. Well, bless God. Bless God. Um, um, keep my family in your prayers. Uh, my, my, my older brother passed away. Oldest brother passed away. I only had one older brother. And um, so not too many of us left in the family, but praise God. We still have to preach the gospel and share the gospel so that everyone in my household, your household, and every household gets saved and knows the Lord Jesus Christ. A shout out to Brian Whitaker. Brian, I hope you're doing well. Come on, say hello to us. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, my condolences to you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And you're doing well, huh? Yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, just got off the phone with my girlfriend. She's still over in the Philippines, so... Okay, okay, okay. I know you can't wait for that plane to land, but you try to be cool, Brian. Hey, Brian, be cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, God bless you all. <clears throat> all right. Okay, Jackie's in the chat window, and she'll be monitoring the chat window. Thank you, Jackie. I appreciate that um, very much for your love, not only for me, but for your love for the, our students and the ministry. And so... Let's get ready. Karen, would you lead us in prayer tonight? Father God, we thank you once again for coming together on a Wednesday evening to have class again. And we ask that you you send your Holy Spirit to be with Dr. Carter as he guides us, as he, as he leads us into more insight, into 
what we're going to be doing this week and and to bring about your mighty word and 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 enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we can we can pick up new insight into your word in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Karen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Now for You're the welcome. homework and some several of you have already completed the homework for uh this week. But one of the questions in the homework is to uh, expound upon um, chapter 22, verse 25 of First Samuel. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no 22, verse 25. So just cross that off your list. Okay, that was a typographical error, my, my mistake. So that list of scriptures on page uh, 5 of your handout, just cross it out. There is no First Samuel twenty-two twenty-five. Okay, so let's take a look at our, our lesson. By the way, continue praying for our nation. Our nation needs much prayer, and um, continue praying that that our nation will totally turn to God and we'll be a godly, righteous nation. Okay, let's take a look at uh, First Samuel. Chapter 1 is all about, I'm going to highlight each chapter and then go into the first uh, chapter 1. Chapter 1 is all about Hannah vowed a vow. Hannah vowed a vow. She made a vow to the Lord. Also in chapter 1 is all about the Nazarite, the Nazarite vow. Um, then we see the birth of Samuel, chapter 1. Chapter 2, Hannah rejoices. And we also see in chapter 2, Eli's evil sons. Chapter 3, thy servant heareth. And that's in quotation marks. Thy servant heareth, or your servant hears, Lord. Chapter 4, a Philistine victory. And the Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines. They made a big mistake in capturing the Ark of the Covenant, ladies and gentlemen. Chapter 5, the power of the Ark of the Covenant. And also in Chapter 5, send away the Ark. Send the Ark away. Get it out of our country. Chapter 6, we see the Ark of the Covenant return to Israel. Chapter 7, the Philistines defeat it. Chapter 8, request for a king. We want a king. We want a king. That was the cry of the Israelites. And chapter 8, Samuel's predictions for Israel, all based on their request for a king. Chapter 9, Samuel meets Saul. Chapter 10, Samuel anoints Saul. And then we see in chapter 10, God is with thee, and also God saved the king. Chapter 11, the Ammonites are defeated. Chapter 12, God's acts are reviewed. A review of the acts of God. Chapter 13, Saul's offering. And then chapter 14, Jonathan's plan. The Philistines are fooled. Saul builds an altar. And Jonathan is rescued. We see in that chapter where Saul made a decree, and Jonathan didn't know about it. And Jonathan violated Saul's decree, and Jonathan was face, facing the death penalty. And uh, Saul ha was facing the uh, probability of putting his own son to death. But the Philist, but the the Israelites overrode the king and spared Jonathan's life. Chapter 15 and. Our assignment for this week goes from chapter 1 through 15. The Amalekites are defeated. Saul's punishment. And then we, we note this famous passage of, passage of Scripture that says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. A powerful message in, in that 15th chapter. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So let's stop. See how far we can go with uh, First Samuel. Now there was a certain man of Ramath, Aim, Zophim. 
Can you imagine being from a town called Ramoth Aim Zophim of Mount Ephraim? And his name was Elkanah. So the man's name was Elkanah. Where are you from, Elkanah? I'm from Ramoth Aim Zophim in Mount Ephraim. Wow, that's a tongue twister. And he was the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and Ephrathite. So they list all these generations. <clears throat> I like the way the Bible gives us these geneal genealogical lists. So we see that Elkanah, we also see uh, his father, and we see his grandfather, and his great-grandfather, and his great-grandfather listed uh, in this first verse. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, <clears throat> and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Verse 3, And this man went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. So do not confuse Hophni, <coughs> I'm sorry, do not confuse this Phinehas with the Phinehas we read about in the book of Joshua. Okay, it's another priest named Phineas. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters, uh, portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. So this is a situation. Elkanah had two wives, one he loved and the one he didn't love that much, and and the one he didn't love that much was barren, and the one he loved less than the first one uh, had children. And uh, verse 6, And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. So there was contention in that household. I guess there would be contention when the man has more than one wife. There has to be contention, jealousy. Uh, we see this throughout portions of Scripture. Uh, let's jump down um, verse 8 then said Elkanah her husband to her Hannah why weepest thou and why eatest thou not and why is thy heart grieved am I not better to thee than ten sons and Elkanah thought that he was the reason why his wife was bitter and weeping all the time and he said am I not better to you than ten sons but he didn't understand uh, she was not fulfilled. She had, did not have children. And so, verse 9, So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. Verse 10, And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow. This is the theme of this chapter. Hannah vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. She made a promise. She made a vow to the Lord. If you'll give me a son, if you'll open my womb and, and give me a son, I will give him back to you. And he will be a, a Nazarite. No razor will come upon his head. And we looked uh, last week, we looked at Samson, who was a Nazarite. And John the Baptist was a Nazarite. And so we know at least three Nazarites in the Bible. Samson, John the Baptist, and um, Samuel. And Nazarites, do not confuse them with Nazarenes. A Nazarene was a person who lived in Nazareth or was born in Nazareth. But a Nazarite was one who was sanctified, consecrated unto God. And Nazarites were consecrated even before they were born. And so no razor was to come upon this child's head. He was not even to eat any of the fruit of the vine. And um, there are other conditions. Okay? And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. He saw her lips moving, 
and she was praying. Her lips were moving, but no sounds coming out. And 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 she was praying in in, in the spirit silently, and he couldn't hear anything. He thought she was drunk. Oh, uh, verse thirteen. And Eli said unto her, verse fourteen, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. We can make judgments, can't we? Uh, we we've all made uh, poor judgments, and he judged her as being drunk, but he had no clue. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. So Eli had judged her. He made a miscalculation in his judgment, and um, she was praying out of grief, out of her spirit. And then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the Lord and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Ladies and gentlemen, in those days, prophets had power. Prophets had power. And, and, and the prophet pronounced a blessing on her. God, God anointed prophets with power. And so she spoke. Uh, he spoke uh, and, and, and said, the Lord grant you what you've been asking for. He didn't even know what she was asking for. But he had the authority and the power as a prophet of God and, 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 and granted her her petition and God backed that up. You know, God will back up uh, his prophets. There are a lot of folks calling themselves prophets and have no relationship with the Lord. But God has anointed many people with a power and authority. I remember, oh, about 30 years, actually it was 1983, I was preaching in Conshohocken. Hey, uh, um, Pastor Lisa Johnson, are you on? Yes, I am. Do you remember the? Okay, let it. Let's have it come out of your mouth. Do you remember the prophecy God spoke about Laverne Noble in that revival? Oh yes, that she was going to have a baby. Yes, you and share her womb that with was everybody. Up. Yes, her womb was closed up, and um, she she wanted a baby, and um, the Lord came by the way and and prophesied over her and told her that she will have a baby and it would be a baby girl. Praise God. Yes. And, 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 and who is that baby girl? Uh, Siobhan. <laughs> My goddaughter, Siobhan. Yeah, yes, Siobhan yes, Noble, yes. yes. God, God spoke through, through this servant, and, 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 and Sister Lisa and her husband Larry were there because Larry was pastor of the church, and, and when that prophecy came through, um, um, Laverne doubled over and grabbed her stomach and began groaning in the spirit, and yes. and 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 um, her husband Paul put his arms around her and cried, and God brought that prophecy forth. Okay, he spoke it through this servant, your 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 servant here. And, yes, uh, he did. A lot of people, a lot of people label they they label him. They, he's crazy. You know, you don't listen to him. But see, God's word, <laughs> God performed His word, and Lisa Johnson is a witness. Uh, she was there and. Um, she saw God do a mighty work. Thanks, Pastor Lisa. Thank you You're so welcome. much for, for being a witness tonight. Ah, ah. Okay? And um, so that's how Samuel uh, came about. He was prophesied by the Lord uh, through, uh, through um, Eli. Verse 17, Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. After that day, she didn't look sad anymore because God had fulfilled uh, his, his promise. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned. And so she knew by faith, ladies and gentlemen, oftentimes before miracles take place, We've got to exercise our faith in the Lord. Laverne and Paul exercised their faith in the Lord at that revival, and it was February. It was, we ended that revival around February 12th, uh, 1983, and Siobhan 
was born that fall of the year. Okay? Um, and so, verse 20, Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about that after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Samuel means ask of the Lord. And so, um, we see... Uh, they make sacrifices un, unto the Lord, and then Samuel is born, and um, we see Hannah rejoicing. Let's go to chapter 2. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. Chapter 2 is all about Sa Hannah's song, her song of praise, her song of worship and praise, because God kept her God kept his promise to Hannah. Okay, verse 20. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of the woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own home. And so Hannah, after the baby was born and weaned, Hannah took uh, Samuel to Eli and presented him to Eli and said, this is a gift of the Lord. In other words, Eli, I'm giving him to you, to the Lord, through you. And Eli had the responsibility to raise that child as a, as a man of God. And um, verse 21, and the Lord visited Hannah. Check this out, ladies and gentlemen, because she kept her promise. She vowed a vow unto the Lord and kept her promise. God open her womb again and again. And verse 21, And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now you have to read chapter 20, verse 21 carefully, like I shared with you last week about reading of these scriptures. The Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived. Now, if you're not careful, you'll say she conceived and had... Uh, uh, quintuplets no she didn't have quintuplets she didn't have all five at once he, she conceived on five different occasions after she gave Samuel back to the Lord verse 22 now Eli was very old and heard that all his sons all that his sons did unto Israel unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation Eli's sons were corrupt, ladies and gentlemen. Eli's sons were corrupt. And later you'll see that Samuel's sons were corrupt, just like Eli's sons were corrupt. Eli was holy. Eli was a holy man. Um, Samuel was a holy man, but they both had corrupt sons. And Eli's sons, uh, they lied with the women. They lay with the women uh, at the door of the tabernacle. In other words, they had sex with the women at the tabernacle. Not only that, but they took the sacrifices and they, they, they took the meat, they sold the meat, they made profit off the people's sacrifices. I mean, these were corrupt men and they were the sons of the priest. And actually, next in line to be the high priest of Israel. Verse 26, and the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. Okay. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear into the house of thy father when they were in Egypt and in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar? to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering, which I have commanded in the, my habitation, and honor thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. So Eli was reprimanded by the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, because of the corruption of his sons. Behold, the days come, verse 31, we're in chapter 2, that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thine house. 
and thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, and all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes, and to grieve thine, house, thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of thine age. God spoke to Eli because Eli would not correct his sons. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a responsibility as parents. And, and to um, reject that responsibility can bring grave circumstances in our lives. And so Eli refused to correct his sons. They were sleeping with the women uh, in, at the door of the tabernacle. And these women were coming to make offerings unto the Lord, but they wound up making offerings unto uh, Hophni and, and, and Phinehas. And God was not pleased with that. And God said, said to Eli, I'm going to cut your family line off, and, and it's going to grieve you, what you'll see happening in your family. And then verse 35, this is what the Lord says, And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart, and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's office, that I may eat a piece of bread. It's going to get so bad, Eli, the Lord says, that your your uh, 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 relatives are going to come begging for bread and, and all because you refuse to uh, chasten your uh, sons and you permitted your sons to desecrate the tabernacle and desecrate uh, um, uh, my people. So Eli knew that he had done wrong but he had no, he had no control over his sons. Ladies and gentlemen, we have responsibility uh, as parents, as, uh, a, uh, as, as guardians, uh, foster parents. We have responsibility. Husbands have responsibility. Wives have responsibility. Children have responsibility. Chapter 3, we're going to look at the call of, of Samuel. Remember, Hannah took him as a young child and gave him to the priest so that the priest could raise Samuel. And even though the priest had um, corrupt sons, Samuel was righteous. And so uh, the so priest's sons were cut off, but God raised up Samuel as a man of God, and he became uh, a mighty man of God, mighty prophet of God, mighty judge of Israel. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So God didn't speak much in those days to people. The word of God was very precious. Verse 2, And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here I am. Ladies and gentlemen, here's a real call from God. Now, everybody's call is different, okay? Uh, but when God speaks, you hear, you hear his voice. Some people have heard an, audio, an, an, uh, an audible voice. Some people have heard an inner voice. But when God speaks to a person and calls them, he calls and makes himself known and appears to them and makes his plans, a portion of his plans, known to the people. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a world where a lot of people call themselves Christians and a lot of people are in leadership positions but are not called. Jesus said, uh, many are called but few are chosen. Many are called. God has called a lot of people and a lot of people have blown God off, you know, just uh, 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 uh just ignored the call, ignored God's voice. I, hmm, I'm not going to I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to be in the ministry. I'm going to do my own thing. Ladies and gentlemen, that has been, taken place many, many times. 
But we see uh, here in, in Scripture where Samuel can, can testify about his calling, a real calling from God. Here's how he heard the voice of God. And I, I really, really want to emphasize this because if, if, you're, if you're not sure of your calling, then you can go to God and ask God. And, I, and I've shared this with people for years. If you're not sure that God has called you, you ask God and, and get a confirmation. Um, I know many, many people who are pastoring churches have pulpits, and, and, uh, and many of them will say, I never had a call from God. Uh, my father was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor, so I was expected to be a pastor. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're not sure, be very sure. Okay, verse 4, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here I am. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I. Uh, Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. Verse 5. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. He thought Eli was calling him. And he said, I called not. Eli, that means Eli said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I. For thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. Go on back to sleep. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Verse 7. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Verse 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in peace. So Eli gave him instructions. If you hear the voice again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant hears. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. God said to Samuel, I'm going to do a new thing in Israel, and I'm going to straighten up Eli's house. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering for evermore. God told Samuel, when I move in Eli's situation, no offering, no sacrifice is going to please me concerning this situation. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me just stop here and say that God has a good memory. A lot of things that we think we're getting away with or have gotten away with or, or we got over in this situation and nobody found out, no secret hidden sins. God knows everything. And so it pays, it pays to repent. It pays to confess our sins, and it pays, as you will, we will learn later on the 15th chapter, uh, uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. It pays to obey God. Do not go another day, if you know there's sin in your heart, do not go another day with sin in your heart. Tomorrow is not promised. You can be here today and gone tomorrow, and the sad thing about hiding iniquity in our hearts. If the scripture says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he won't even hear me. If I know that there is sin and evil in my heart, God won't even hear me. God told Samuel, no uh, sacrifice uh, will, will be able to purge Eli of the sins of his household. Verse 15, and Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. 
and Samuel showed, he feared to show Eli the vision. Samuel was just a kid, a child. And he was afraid to speak the vision to Eli of what God said. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, here am I. And he said, <laughs> what is the thing that the Lord has said unto thee? What did God reveal to you? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. So Samuel says, hey, uh, Eli says, tell me, what is the vision? What did God speak to you? Uh, don't hide it from me. If, if you hide it from me, may a worse thing come upon you. And Samuel told him every wit, in other words, all the words, all the things, and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what, he se what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew. And, 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 and so back up. Let me back up. Eli said, okay, that's God's will. Let God's will be done. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did, not let, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And as, as we back up to verse 18, here was a good opportunity for Eli to repent. We don't know if he did or not, but Eli could have repented at that time, and he still there was, would still be an opportunity for him to get blessed. But Eli, we don't see it in Scripture, and we cannot assume that it happened, but we know as we, we read on, Hophni and Phinehas died in the same day, and then uh, Eli uh, had suffered a horrible death. So it pays, ladies and gentlemen, to love the Lord. It pays to, to, to be faithful to God. And, and, and um, I, I, I pray that none of you or nobody we know will hide uh, behind religion. Uh, don't hide behind your pastorate or your office as a prophet or your office as a Sunday school teacher or, or the fact that you're a Christian. Don't think that you can do anything you want to. We learn from the book of Judges. Every man did that which was right in his own sight. But God is the judge, and he knows everything um, that we do. Even our words, every word that proceeds out of our mouth, God knows, and we've got to give an account. Okay, chapter 4, the uh, theme in chapter 4, the Philistines win a victory, and they capture the Ark of the Covenant. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read a whole lot of this particular chapter because we have several more chapters to go. But in this, about in this chapter, the Philistines came against Israel and they fought against Israel and defeated Israel. And then they captured the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which was a big mistake. Um, verse, 15, verse 11, and the Ark of God was taken and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. This was a sad day in Israel's history. Not only was the Ark of the Covenant captured by the Philistines, but Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, died in the same battle. Verse 12, And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the, the same day with his clothes rent, and with earth upon his head, he, he, he tore his clothes and threw earth, dirt on his head, which meant he was in mourning. And when he came to, when he came low, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also 
Hophni and Phineas are dead, and the ark of God is taken. Verse 18 of chapter 4, And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that Eli fell dead from off the seat, backward by the side of the gate. Eli was sitting on a seat, and, and he fell backward by the side of the gate, and his neck broke, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel 40 years. Okay, so Eli fell off the seat he was sitting on. He was a heavy man. He broke his neck when he fell, and he died after having served Israel 40 years as a judge. 19, and his daughter-in-law finished his wife, was with child. Uh, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. So uh, Eli's daughter-in-law died. Uh, she gave birth and then she died. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory of the Lord is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of the father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. So that was a sad day in, in, in Israel's history. Chapter 5, we're looking at the power of the ark of the covenant and the Philistines take it away, take it away. We're going to look and see in this chapter the power, the anointing on the ark of the covenant. By the way, the ark of the covenant, ladies and gentlemen, was a box about uh, three and a half feet long, one and a half feet wide, and uh, about one and a half feet deep. And in that ark contained the, uh, the Ten Commandments tablets, uh, a, a pot of manna, and, and Aaron's rod that budded. But the ark itself, and it had over it uh, a, 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 a lid or a top called the mercy seat with two cherubim with their arms stretched out to touch one another and this Ark of the Covenant was a box that God had Moses to create to represent the Ark was so powerful it represented the presence of the Lord and God's covenant with his people and whenever Israel moved the Ark went before them whenever they went into battle the Ark went before them so even the enemy knew of the power of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, don't get confused by, you know, Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark. I mean, that movie, I mean, that, that, that movie, that's a blasphemous movie, blas blasphemous movie, Indiana Jones and the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was not to be played with, ladies and gentlemen. So chapter 5, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. So the Philistines took the ark of the covenant and put it in the house of their god, Dagon. Verse 3, And, and when they of Ashdod rose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was falling upon his, was falling upon his faith his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. Now Dagon, was a, a, a statue of their god Dagon, in the house that they built for Dagon. So they put the ark of the covenant in there with, with Dagon. And the next day when people looked in there, Dagon had fallen off his perch, off, off his pedestal, and fallen on his face. And Verse 4, when they rose early in the morning, morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. So the next day, Dagon, he was messed up. That statue didn't have any arms, okay? 
Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod until this day. <laughs> I wouldn't go there either. I wouldn't go there either until this day, meaning until the day of the writing of this uh, scripture. Okay? Not until 2020, but until the day of the writing of this scripture. Nobody went into the house of Dagon anymore. Um, but somebody had to go in to get the Ark of the Covenant out. So we see, we see, uh, we see that. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. So the, the, the men were smut, smitten with boils, ladies and gentlemen, emeralds. Uh, um, Karen's a nurse. She might know about em something about emeralds from her experience as a nurse, but I understand there they are uh, sores and 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 uh, um, growths and and sores in the in the in 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 in, in a private area. And when the men of Ashdod Dad saw that it was so, they said, "The ark of the God of Israel will shall not abide with us." For his, his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. So they sent the ark to Gath, and then the people of Gath, the men of Gath, suffered. Okay, and the city suffered. Verse 10, therefore they sent the ark of God to Akron. They didn't know what to do with the ark of, of the covenant. They should have left the ark of the covenant alone. And it came to pass, as the ark of the Lord came to Akron, that the Akronites cried out, saying, they have brought about the ark of God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to his own place, and that it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that died not were smitten with the emeralds, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. And ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about destruction because the Philistines had no business messing with the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant had no business being captured by the Philistines because Israel sinned. Do you see how sin has great repercussions? Chapter 6 the ark is returned. Okay? So the Philistines, I mean, they caught it. They caught it. They caught it. And so, um, verse 7, Now therefore make a new cart and make, take two milk kine and two milk cows on which they have come no yoke and tie the cows to the cart and bring their calves home from them and take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which ye return him for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away that it may go. <clears throat> and see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast, etc., etc. And the men did so. Uh, verse 10. And so they returned the Ark of the Covenant to Israel. Uh, the Philistines said, look, we've had it. We've had it. We can't take any more. Get rid of this ark. Send it back to Israel. Send it back to Israel. And that's what they did. Okay? And um, verse 15, verse 14, And the ark came into the field of Joshua, a Beshemite, and stood there, where there was a great stone, and they claved the wood of the ark, and wood of the cart, and offered the kind of burnt offering unto the, the Lord. They even burnt those cows uh, that were pulling the ark. 
as an offering unto the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, where the jewels of gold were, and put them on the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered great offerings and sacrifice sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. And these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering, etc., etc. So verse 21, And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kirjath Jearim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. Chapter 7, The Philistines were defeated. Chapter 8, after the defeat of the Philistines, then the people request a king. Chapter 8 of First Samuel. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judge over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Isn't it amazing how many of, uh, of uh, many uh, PKs do not walk with the Lord, preacher's kids? Um, Eli's sons did not walk with the Lord. And now Samuel's sons did not w walk with the Lord. Uh, they were greedy for lucre, meaning money. They took bribes and they perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel, verse 4, chapter 8, gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said, Behold, thy sons are old and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king. And so Samuel uh, tells them, No, no, God should be your king. You don't need a king. Verse 6, But the thing displeased Samuel. And when they said, Give us a king to judge us, and Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Very, very powerful verse. Samuel warned them about wanting a king. And... Um, Americans need to be warned about wanting a king. But God said, hey, if they want a king, let them have a king. They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting my best because they think they need a king like the nations around them. Powerful passage of Scripture. Read the rest of chapter 8 for yourself, okay? <clears throat> chapter 9. Uh, Sam, Samuel makes certain predictions in chapter 8 and tells them all the destruction that will come upon them because of their desire for a king. And Samuel describes, he prophesies to them what kind of king they're going to get and what's going to happen to their sons and daughters and what's going to happen to the nation. But the people did not pay heed to the prophets. I wonder what prophets Americans are listening to today. Um... Some of them are so convinced that they're politically correct. I wonder what prophets Americans are listening to today. Just saying. Just saying. Chapter 9, request for a king. I'm sorry. Samuel meets Saul. <clears throat> it's all about how Samuel met Saul. And um, verse 6, and he said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God, and he's an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither. Peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. Saul and his servant are out looking for uh, some of the animals of Saul's father that had escaped and got, had gotten lost. So they're out looking for those animals, and they venture out and uh, uh, need to find their way. So they hear that there's a... A, a prophet, a man of God in their vicinity. Then says Saul to a servant, verse 7 of chapter 9, But before, behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? 
for the bread is spent in our vessels, and there's not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? In those days, they took the man of God a gift, um, some kind of gift. And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Now, that does not mean that you bought, you purchased a blessing, but it meant that you honored the man of God by giving the man of God a blessing, uh, some kind of money or some kind of gift uh, for, for blessing. And so um, Saul and his servant are on their way to meet Samuel. Verse 15, look how God works in this situation. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time, God is awesome, Tomorrow about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be a captain over my people Israel, and he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry has come up unto me. God told uh, God told Samuel the day before Saul showed up, tomorrow a man of Benjamin, of the tribe of Benjamin is coming. He's the one uh, that you're to anoint as king. Okay, verse 25, And when they were come down from the high place unto the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. And they rose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul up to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the Lord pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Chapter 10. Saul anoints Samuel to be the king of Israel. Then Samuel took a vial. Let me reread uh, verse 27. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Okay, so the servant passed on, and then in privacy, uh, Samuel anoints Saul. Okay, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And, and so Saul is anointed to be the king of Israel. Verse 9, and it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. So uh, Sam, Saul was a very meek man, a humble man. Um, but God gave him a new heart, gave him a new heart. Verse 9, and when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And he prophesied among them. Saul was anointed by the Lord. The Holy Spirit came upon Saul. And Saul prophesied. He became a prophet. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that is coming to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? So Saul prophesied, okay? And um, eventually he's prophesied. He, he becomes the king of Israel. And the tribes, the tribes uh, receive him. Verse 24, And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him, see ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. God save the king. That's what the people shouted. You know, you be careful how, what people shout because everybody, the majority is not always correct. They're saying God save the king. And even though Saul prophesied, the spirit of the God was upon him. He had the anointing. 
Saul does not obey the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Verse 26, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Chapter 11, the Ammonites are defeated. Chapter 12, the acts of God are reviewed. And Samuel reviews what God had done for the people, reminded them of the mighty ways of God. Chapter 13, Saul makes an offering. Saul makes an offering. Okay. Um, Saul didn't last, <clears throat> didn't stay obedient to God for so long. Uh, his obedience to God was very short-lived. Um, Saul took it upon himself, ladies and gentlemen, to make an offering unto the Lord. He was supposed to, in chapter 13, Saul was supposed to wait for Samuel, and Samuel tarried. Verse 8, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And so Saul did not wait until Samuel. Samuel was the prophet. But Saul took it upon himself to make an offering unto God in Samuel's stead. And, and even though Saul had been anointed, Saul prophesied, the Holy Spirit was upon him. Saul disobeyed God in a the, in, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He had lost his anointing. And verse 9 of chapter 13, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offerings, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. Verse 11, And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal. Verse 13, And Samuel said to Saul, because Saul had announced that he had uh, offered a burnt offering to the Lord, Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord, thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. God would have established Saul's kingdom in Israel forever. But Saul disobeyed and took upon himself to make an offering unto God. He was not the priest. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. Verse 14. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded him. Ladies and gentlemen, it pays to obey the Lord. You might be anointed today and in a powerful ministry, <clears throat> But one sin, one sin can cause you to lose your anointing. And Samuel arose, verse 15, and got him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. And so Samuel left, and um, Saul continues. He is backslidden. He's in sin. Chapter 14, we see Jonathan's plan. Uh, Jonathan um, had a plan to defeat the Philistines, and his plan worked even though he went against something his father said. His father had declared a fast, and Jonathan was not there when his father declared the fast, and Jonathan and the handful of men with him ate some honey, and when Saul found out about it, he was he was tempted to put his son Jonathan to death for disobeying the word of the king. And the, uh, the army spoke up. The army spoke up and said, oh, no, 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 you're not going to kill Jonathan. Jonathan won this battle for us. You're not going to kill Jonathan. 
they overrode the king. They stood up. We need people in America to stand up for righteousness, ladies and gentlemen. We need people who are going to stop being political puppets and dupes and flunkies and stand up for righteousness. We need preachers, pastors, prophets, teachers, apostles, evangelists to stand up and not be tools of the government, not be tools of politicians, not be tools of the people. We need people who are going to stop being punks in the pulpit and stand up for righteousness and not just to try to please the people, to hold on to their jobs and their positions. With that, we're going to stop. We're going to stop the narrative and the teaching tonight. Uh, next week, we're looking at chapters. We'll start again in chapter 15 and go to the end of 1 Samuel, chapter 31, and complete uh, that particular lesson. Okay, you have your assignment. Uh, you should have an assignment sheet or a document that I sent to you. Um, so read chapters 16 to 31 for next week. You have one, two, Jackie Carter. You have three questions next week. <laughs> Not two. You have three questions next week. Okay. Oh, whoopee. Yeah, yeah, whoopee, whoopee, whoopee. Anything that we need to attend to tonight, Jackie? Uh, CK has a question. Uh, okay. when, the, when the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant, why were those who moved it? not struck down by God as in the time of Noah when the unappointed people touched the ark and they were struck down. Okay, that's a good question, C.K. And I have to read that again, and, and you read it again. Um, you know, the, the ark of the covenant had um, loops on the side of it where you, they would stick in the staves, okay? So it's possible that the... The uh, Philistines did not look inside of the Ark of the Covenant, did not lift the cover off it, and only picked it up by the staves, those poles, CK, that went into those loops on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, uh, if, if they didn't die, weren't put to death, that means they did not touch the box itself, that they knew um, how, how to handle the Ark of the Covenant. It had poles that it was supposed to be carried with, and I'm I'm, I'm assuming they uh, did right by carrying the Ark of the Covenant by its poles. Okay, we also raised a good question: How come God didn't zap them for stealing the Ark of the Covenant? God had a plan, C.K. God wanted that Ark in uh, Philippine territory, and 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 so so he could justify. Uh, 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 punishing the Philistines and when he punished them enough they said enough is enough take this ark back to Israel CK okay that's my best explanation Jackie you have any, anything else uh, nope okay okay well, we covered a lot of ground. We covered a whole lot of ground uh, uh, today. Okay, I see uh, Dr. Gene. Thanks, Dr. Gene. I received a message that Black Heroes of the Bible was announced on Reach Radio um, in, in, in Delaware. Yes, this is Black History Month, ladies and gentlemen, and a lot of the radio stations are playing excerpts from my book, uh, Black Heroes of the Bible. By the way, I did put that graphic up uh, tonight, Black Heroes of the Bible, and we offer to anyone a free copy of this book. This book is 342 pages. If you don't have a copy of this book, you ought to get one. Uh, several people have requested, and what we're doing, I'm donating a book to anybody who wants a copy, but we're also asking for a donation to the ministry, to Back to Basics Ministry. If you don't have a donation, you can still get a book. So... Check out my website or, or, or uh, connect with me so you get a copy of this great book. This book is all about 21 blacks in the Bible. How do we know they are black? Because this is your servant, the servant of the Lord. I did my research and I studied those key words uh, about the Nubians and the Cushites and the uh, people from Africa 
and did historical background on them. Twenty-one people uh, throughout Scripture and and their their uh, the works that they did. The Ethiopians, Cushites, the Nubians. So it's a great book, and it 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 has this book has helped revolutionize Bible study in a lot of areas. In fact, in a lot of nations of the world, you can get a free copy. Um, just get in touch with me. Okay, anything else, Jackie? Okay, CK, did that answer your question? She was having problems getting unmuted. Yeah, this is CK. Yes, it, it did. Um, I was thinking that maybe uh, even if they didn't know how to carry it, maybe God had a lesson that he was trying to teach, and so that was why. Yeah, but we we know we know CK that God is not double minded. Okay, right. He's not going to put one standard here and use another standard there. So so our best guess, our best scenario, CK, is that they knew what those poles, those staves on the side of that box were for. You lift that box up, four men carry that box. One, uh with the stave on the shoulder, that one up on the left front and one on the left rear and one on the right front, four men with those staves on their shoulders, but no hands touch that box, touch that arc, okay? Right. Okay, All thanks. Right. Hmm? Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, thank you, CK, for being alert and, 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 and challenging, and, and, and uh, I love your questions, okay? And... Um, CK, I, I love the fact that CK uh, will, 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 will raise a question and not be afraid to raise a question and, and challenge when the challenge is done. And then I like the way you challenge. She's not harsh when she challenges. She, she's very intellectual and a, a very precious person. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Welcome. Okay, praise God. Thank you, Pastor. Lisa Johnson. Lisa Johnson, close us out with, oh, oh. Dr. Jean Bratton, anything you want to share? No. <laughs> Not at this time. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right. That You know what that means, ladies and gentlemen? It's 8.15. Dr. Bratton is ready to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jean, you know how to preach it. Yeah. Am I right about it? Am I right about it? Go, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pastor Lisa Johnson, would you close us out in prayer, please? Amen. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We praise you for your your word, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword that still pierces and abides in the bone from the marrow. We thank you, Lord God, for your word and your understanding of your word because you said in your word that you give us understanding to the simple. I thank you, Lord, for your understanding. I thank you for wisdom. I thank you for our teacher and his wife. In the name of Jesus, continue to bless us the more, God, as we hunger and thirst for your word like never before, and it's all in the matchless name of Jesus. We thank you, we praise you, and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you, everybody, for coming on, and uh, <laughs> thank you for those of you who, are, who cannot be with us live but are listening to the recording. We love you all, and keep on trusting the Lord with amen. all your heart. God bless you all. Apostle Carter. Yes. Good night. I agree with your I agree with your wife because I was telling my grandson he was laughing. I said he gives us two questions, but he got five in the midst of the one question. I said, "Oh my God, help me, Lord Jesus." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jackie Carter, Jackie Carter said, "Wow, you're working us. You're working yes. us. Yeah. You're working us." I said, "But <laughs> look at the, the result when you finish these courses. You all are gonna be awesome. What a blessing." <laughs> Love you all. Amen. Good night. Good night. Love you. Good night.